at 1 o'clock on Thursday online. So go to grofuniversity.com and go into the training classes and view the upcoming training and link in the link. Instagram. Instagram. Thank you. By Holly. Using Holly on a new Instagram. Yeah, they just changed their algorithm. Just as I said, so we're going to go over the new algorithm for Instagram. So that'll be at 1 o'clock via Zoom um, on Thursday. In addition, we have a tool called All Post Research, and that gives you some really great information about the market. So you can sign up for it, just contact me. Uh, it's, it's no cost to us if you guys want to go out and get it without any bucks a month. Um, and it just it's similar to the Crawford Report, but it allows you to look up by zip code, by city, by county, all the statistics of what's going in the market, what's selling, uh, the county you're going to market, all of that good information. Awesome. All right. And while we get started, let's start here and let's just go down. Just say your name and hi to everyone real briefly so we can get through them and we'll, we'll be done by 11, y'all. All right, she should have the dinosaur. Three rock title. How do I fall that? I love Sarah. You got start with her. Sarah Edwards unicorn. For all animals. Yeah. Linda Childers. I'll wait there. You go ahead, then. Jen Harmon. Eric Harley. Jordan Colvin. Lucinda Conlon. Susan Lane, rock title. Dave Poquette. Carla Matthew. I thought we're gonna all be spirit animals. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Altos report. This is exactly what she was talking about. Um, I receive it on all of the counties in which I usually teach in now. So that way I can show it to all the state because what's really cool is wouldn't it be nice to follow up with sellers, you know, that weren't ready because their price point's not where they thought it was. I mean, how many listings do you think you're going to lose over the fact that you can't control the market, but not lose forever, lose right now until they're in the mindset of, you know, I can still make it happen with this much, right? And so this is a great follow-up tool, and it shows us that we're still in a strong seller's market. We're at 53 in Maricopa County. And then when you look over here, it says our median list price is 574 right now. It's a minute ago, that was like 650. And I want you to know when it was 650, I felt like this. Oh, home affordability is such a huge issue. And still at 574, home affordability is such a huge issue. I mean, the people in the circles you fall, you're with, you might not feel that yet. But for the basic person who's renting, it's still pretty unreachable compared to what we were five years ago when you could sell that house at 350. So when people are like, oh my gosh, we're going down. I'm like, you're joking, right? You have to be joking. Um, median price of new listings, 549.9. This will help you with a seller, get them in the right mind space when we go to talk about pricing today, because this is not created by you. This is a third party product that you utilize through your favorite title company, Rock Title. And what happens is this is crunching the numbers, right? Let, let me take you to a site that will talk about your city. Let me talk about your county. And the cool thing about that is, is when you can show somebody, you're like, I promise I'm not just making it up. I am not here to finagle data to make you happy. My job as a realtor, and you should write this article down, is per article 11 of the code of ethics. There are certain things I must do to educate and inform you on today's marketplace. I proudly subscribe as a Realtor member, because that was an option. Y'all didn't have to be Realtor. You couldn't work here, but you know, you have to. <laughs> realtor member to not lie to you, to not skew the numbers, but to talk to you about reality and empower you with the facts of today. And this is a great way for me to show you that a minute ago, we were at 100% of a seller's market. And maybe that's where your head is right now. Because yes, two months ago, your neighbor did make a wish and they let priced 100,000 too much. They blew out the candle. And for the first time ever, birthday wishes do come true. <laughs> Based on a wish, right? 
And so now we're more of a neutralized market where it's still a seller's market, but it's more negotiable. So things we need to start talking about are concessions, credits, and uh, repairs. Are you going to do the repairs? People always right now are talking about in lieu of repairs. Have you ever met a buyer that has no idea how to change the AC filter? Yeah, when you talk money and little repairs, you know what they do? <gasps> I just don't want to touch it. I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? Um, and that's nothing wrong with it, but those are also perfect candidates for home warranties. <laughs> um, but these are just things that we can talk about and it will assist you. It also shows you the median rent right now, which is a big deal. Because if you have investor clients, this is a pretty big deal. $24.50 is our tipping point. $24.50 to let you know an idea of how much someone needs to bring home as their gross to qualify is $7,500 a month to qualify for that rent. That is not even minimum wage. So our median, <laughs> right? Our median, it's not even touching it. Yeah. And our tipping point is like, there's like nothing actually available for most Arizonians, most people moving in. And then you got to think 2450, by the time you pay your security deposit, your pet deposit, your cleaning deposit, your first month's rent, and any other deposits or fees that you might incur for that rental property, you're about $7,000 into it already. So is this something we should be talking to somebody back about? The Home and Five program is back. Yes, yeah, a little bit bigger on the um, interest because it's a grant program, but with three and a half percent down, could you qualify for a loan now? Knowing that in a seller's market, we need to talk about concessions. We were talking about that earlier, right, Marsha? Yeah. We need to talk about what are you willing to help somebody with, a seller, to make them want to buy your house. Maybe we don't bring down your sales price, but if you gave someone $4,000 and that covers the majority of their closing costs and we got them to move forward maybe with minimal or no repair still, because still in a seller's market, that could open the pool of buyers, right? Because most savvy buyers that were just in here a minute ago that were like, I will, Robert Kawasaki, the market. <laughs> That's leverage, by the way. Rich dad for that leverage. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> They're like, I don't like money that costs money. Because um, 3% was like free money. Why not use leverage? Where else can you make 3%, right? Like pay 3%, what's that? But now seven, those savvy buyers are out and people who need a home are in. So just, these are great tools. So thank you, um, Bree, for bringing up the Altos report. So what we're gonna do, um, does everybody have pen and paper? Do you need something? I can hook you up. Oh, here. I got you. I, I know I have it. Okay, because I didn't do a printout for you today because when I do printouts, what I find is that people lose their printouts and they're, they don't remember what we went over because they didn't write it down. So we're gonna start with, We're going to start with pricing. So this is familiar to all of you, right? Is ARMLS. I just spent Friday in Flagstaff teaching pricing. I spent a day two months ago in Prescott. Yeah, it's Prescott. I always mess up Payson and Prescott, but I go both ways. Um, <laughs> discussing pricing. I want to ask you a question. Do you think I am geographically competent to sell in Prescott, Payson, or Flagstaff? No. Thank you for knowing that. No, I'm not. You know why? Because I need GPS to find the Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can't find coffee when you're a coffee addict, I was going to say love her, but let's just face it. <laughs> my drug of course. <laughs> when you need coffee to survive on a daily basis and you need GPS to find your coffee in a certain area, you are breaking the code of ethics. You are not geographically competent to be working in that area. And isn't that something we need to know? But pricing is the same concept, but there, are, there is an art I cannot teach you. You will learn the art of pricing through doing it constantly, through there are gut feelings. Um, I can do numbers and I can do stats, but we all know, even if the numbers prove sometimes that this house can definitely sell at 750, based on the last 90 days. But let's think, what's occurred in the last 90 days? We've had adjustments, not up, but down. And in the past two and a half years, we had adjustments up. So knowing we're gonna base everything historically, I can sit here and I can typically price point anything with numbers. 
but I don't know that marketplace to know what kind of buyers are being attracted here. What kind of buyers in the pool of green, meaning money, are really going here. So maybe the 750, even though I can justify it, I really need to price it at like 744.9 to get that gap, to get more buyers, because the buyer mindset in 2022B, as our friend Jim Sexton pointed out, is where's my deal? Where's the adjustment? Right? So how do I get that gap? Because 5,000 at the end of the day isn't huge when it comes to 750. Right? And then do I still meet the need of getting that seller what's called multiple offers? I don't mean 50. I don't mean 15. I don't even mean 10. I'm just looking for two. Because <laughs> they're still in the mindset. So how do I satisfy the mindset? Not underprice the property, still stay at fair market value. That, that's the art that you're all going to have an individual feeling on. See, I'm very conservative with numbers. Um, when I go in, I need to justify it. And then I'm usually a couple thousand below when I'm talking about marketability. But I have a girlfriend in our business who always adds like five to 10 grand. She's like, and we're here and we're going to show why you're the best. And I'm like, and we're here and we're going to get the best buyers. And she's like, I don't care if they're canceled. I'll do it again. And I'm like, I would rather them just stick around. You know, retention is everything. She's like, recruit, recruit, recruit. <laughs> That's the total concept of buyers. You retain the buyer throughout the process and they're happy and they close or they go away and you have to recruit another buyer, right? You have to market that property. So um, that is a piece that you're all going to vary on. Can we agree to that? Mm -hmm. And you can only know that piece if you go out and you tour homes, you go to open houses, you pay attention on what's moving, you listen to consumers without a license. There are some consumers that have a license. <laughs> right. Don't listen to them. They have opinions. They don't do anything. <laughs> Listen to people who are actively trying to do better, right? Or actively part of the marketplace. And that will help you with the pricing discussion. So in the here, what we're going to do is the very first thing you always do when you go to price a home is you look up what? Huh? Look homes. Okay, before that? The house. The house, yeah. Yeah, and where do we look up the house? <laughs> I'm totally getting Alex a whole dozen donuts just for himself. <laughs> yeah, tax records. Um, I'm going to challenge you to stay away from ABM's automated value models until you have deciphered a value for yourself. If you look at <clears throat> Zillow, Google, RPR, monsoon comparables, you will sit there and with a, a bias in your head without even realizing you already have it and you're going to try to justify, justify, justify what you found. We don't want to justify anything. We want, we want to pretend right now that house is worth $0 and we're trying to give it a value. So the very first thing you do is go to monsoon. And I'm just thinking um, for the sake of not knowing, because I haven't lived there in six months or paid attention other than do my tenants pay on time, let's go ahead and comp out my house in Avondale, right? Like that's a pretty fun comp. Um, so what I would do is I would just type in the address above. And this will help my husband because like he asked, What's this house worth? What's that house worth? I'm like, I can make a crap and tell you all day and not feel guilty about it. <laughs> but if you were a consumer, I'd want to be honest. So I guess I'll be honest for this week. Yeah. I don't know if I'll look it up next week. Um, so my property is listed here. What's great about the map, right, is that I can look at the map as a whole and kind of get an idea of what things are going for. Like I can see we just had one that sold for 425, 452. What you also that's great about the map, if you don't know a subdivision, it helps you visualize the subdivision. So here I see there's this big canal gap, which I know that's a canal, you see a gap. All right. This is still Garden Lakes, but I know this side of Garden Lakes was built in the 90s. And I know this side of Garden Lakes was built in the 80s. And if I go out from here, and these are things you need to do for yourself, you need to kind of like check it out and look and see, hey, what's going on? Yeah, I don't want to click on you yet, but thank you so much for playing. Um, I can see that there is a reason it's called Garden Lakes because um, in Arizona, they think ponds are lakes. <laughs> right. So this pond has an inner circle and this pond has an inner circle and then there's this outer circle. Well, this is things you have to analyze when you're looking at prices because would it be fair to take a house from over here 
next to this um quarry like there's just a bunch of garbage over here by the way um I, I don't really know what it is it's a golf course and it looks like it was a dump at one time i just see trucks go in and out so can i take this house and compare it to one over here no that's that's not reasonable right that that's a whole different amenity that's a whole different breeze issue <laughs> why live next to a pond because there's breeze why live next to a puddle because they call them a pond here <laughs> um and my friend one day told me when we were driving through Garden Lakes before I lived there, I had a buyer that was looking for a property and he said, look, Mandy, there's a side with sneeches with stars on their belly. And there's a side with sneeches with no stars on their belly. And I was just like, you totally have kids. I totally have kids. I get that. It's Dr. Seuss, <laughs> <Bruce>, right? <laughs> when every subdivision is true, there, there's properties that are more attractable than other properties that might be considered outliers within the community. How many buyers feel really good going a mile into the ins and outs to find the, the house? So like, how much commute time do I have just from the main road when I'm in the subdivision, right? So you always have to kind of look at like the marketability that goes into that art of pricing. And so these properties with stars on their belly have more value than these properties. Is that fair to say? And it's because I'm looking at the community as a whole. I can also tell you, um, if I go out, you'll see Indian School Road right up here. If they are backing the Indian School Road, do I need to take off value? Right, so all these things come into play. Even if you're two houses in from the main road, will you still hear the main road? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the house I live in now is on Greenway Parkway. And if you go to the Half Moon Bar, I'd really love it if you could tell me exactly where the fuse box is because I would like it to shut down at 11. I'm going to say that it's a property value decrease after 11. <laughs> um, but that's something to know. Then we go into looking at the information we need to know off the tax base. You always need to know who the owners are. This is extremely important. If you are unsure, it's great to call Susan Lane and ask for a prelim on the property because sometimes you're going to see an LLC name or a trust name and they don't always actually have the people listed. That's a great reason to call Bree and ask for a listing package because then she can give you all the facts on the property and who you should be speaking to. If a trust was listed there, I would like you to know that they do need to have the seller's name listed as the trust. And then the signors would be the trustees. Does that make sense? And escrow will need a copy of the trust certification. Yes. Escrow needs lots of things. <laughs> Usually when we ask, they go like this. Oh. <laughs> I have a trust piece of paper. <laughs> what is it? Where do I find it? But you know what's great is when you have a great escrow officer, you can actually connect them directly with your seller. Mm -hmm. And they will talk to them and guide them through what they're asking for. Because when you say to someone, I'm going to need a copy of your trust, they're, it's going to be why. They don't actually need all of the trust. They need the pages, the front page, the last page, the declarations, and what is regarding the house only. So a tr some people are like, wow, you're nosy. <laughs> like, And honestly, I don't even need a copy. I need you to send it directly to my escrow officer. It's actually better if I receive less personal information on you because then I am homebound free with confidentiality. Yeah. Um, it then tells you the class of the house. So this one's classified as a residential rental, which would tell me, hey, maybe this owner is really going to be focused on the numbers because right now they're receiving some kind of income, right? So they're going to focus on the numbers. It goes into my legal descriptions, but what's really important for comparables is the lot size of my property, the size of the home, the year built, and if there is a pool. Also, if it's a multiple story property or a single story property, and that's gonna be listed here because can I really truly compare one stories to two stories? No, no, you shouldn't. If you do, you're, you're gonna have some huge adjustments and are adjustments ever based on price per square foot? No. So, Try that one for size. That's going to be a good time, right? Just to let you know, a single story home will always hold more value over the long term than a multiple story home. Why? Land use. 
So what I love all your things and stuff. I mean, those are great. Yeah, I mean, I, you can totally sell all of those were sellable comments. <laughs> but it's really the one thing we can never make more of is the land. We can never make more land, right? You can buy more land, but you can't make more land unless you're in Florida and you like swamp. That's a whole other discussion. All right, so you can't make more land. So a single story takes more land usage than a two story. So if it's using more land, that's why it, it sustains its value better. You doing okay? Happy Marshall? Cool. Don't I look happy? Totally happy. I just wanted to check in with you. It will also talk about the garage. And this is a two car garage because if this didn't have any covered parking, will that take off value? Even in historic Phoenix where slabs were cool at one point, that is not very marketable and it actually takes value down. So these are things you have to look for. It then goes into who bought it and when they bought it. The one thing this is not showing in this list, right? This is the deed changeover. Is if Mandy and Jacob ever refi the property. And that would play into my next sheet, right? I mean, I need to ask the question, but it's not nice when you just know. So if I go down to mortgage, it will then take into account the fact that, hey, I am showing that in 2020, something happened. Now, what's interesting to me is I, I know, I know at least one spouse here <laughs> decided to refi in 2021, and that's not showing. So knowing that on myself tells me that I need you guys to ask your sellers, Hey, do you know how much you owe on the property, right? How many liens do you have on the property? But when I start that conversation, I just start asking about money. Is that a good feeling? No, I say, hey, I would love to bring you a proper net sheet. So we could talk about sales price, but you could also talk about what I'm trying to put in your pocketbook. So would you mind letting me know how much you owe on the property? And do you know about what interest rate it is? Also, there is a book called um, Asking More Beautiful Questions. I have not read it, but it was highly recommended. <laughs> but if you want me to sound smart, there's this book I read. <laughs> and I haven't bought it yet, but my, um, somebody I follow named Lee Brown, she really lives by it. And something she does, she has a whole list of questions she's going to ask somebody before she ever goes to the listing. But the very first question she asks them is, hey, uh, to properly be prepared for you. I have some questions I would like to ask you. They might be considered a little personal. Is it okay if I ask the question? And so she, the first question she asks is permission to ask questions. So she gets their buy-in to the conversation and makes somebody feel empowered instead of you just landing them with questions. So just a little tidbit. Also in this subdivision section, it will tell me how many um, properties there are this says Garden Lake Estates, though. This is something that I think you guys really need to look into. Let me see here. I can't make that bigger. Right here, it says Garden Lake Estates. How many master plan communities do we go in on a daily basis? As a real tour, or for your thing a lot? Well, I'm just going to let you know, every little block sometimes is its own mini subdivision and the big subdivision. So here is saying that these, the year built ranges between 87 and 91, 31%, I mean, 31 half pools. Garden Lake Estates is about three blocks of Garden Lake. But when the consumer and people, when you live there, you just think Garden Lake. Actually, it's called Garden Lake. And then there's always a little subdivision, mini subdivision. So pay attention to this too, because your client, especially if they're the first owner, they will really know that I'm in the higher end of this master plan community, or I was in the middle, like this is actually called this. So pay real close attention right here as well. All right, you also need to know the tax information because this is gonna be based on your net sheet. And remember taxes are always paid in arrears. So it's always gonna be based on the last doable bill. Is there a better way to say that, Susan? Well they are paid in arrears and so january through june is paid in october and july through december is paid the following year in march which is a little bit of brain damage um so most of the time it gets very very confusing for the, the seller because when i show the taxes are due they're like i already paid that but you did for last year yeah and so it you're we're always looking where we are here, but most people are looking at the year before. Yep. 
So that's always good to know. So now it's let's go into the fun stuff, right? Quick search. Everybody's best friend, I hope. It's the only way to search now. <laughs> <laughs> so you go to quick search, and the, the keys I'm going to put in is always going to be how far back do you think I should go for comparable? Well, in this market, 30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday. All right. How many homes do I need to find on a closed? How many homes do I need to find on a closed status? Three. Three. So we're going to start, we can start with 60 days and see if we get three alike comparables, but you definitely want to go back. We usually go back 90 days because an appraiser is going to go back 90 days. So you need to find any duds in there. The maximum amount you can go back when pulling comparables is six months. But that's an extreme reason because that first 90 days should really be where you're focused. Now we keep saying two weeks because it feels like the market does something new every day, but I just want you to know the major shift happened in price pointing seven weeks ago. So that's already 60 days back. Yes, sir. That's been interesting is doing open houses when you're talking to people that are not represented at the moment is that when they ask you how much homes are, it's actually a great conversation to have with them now because I told them that that's what they found. That's what they because I, things have changed so fast in the past 30 days that it's like you have to sit down and actually see like the trend that actually is like, you know, yeah. it's a huge difference. Yeah. And they're like kind of looking at us like, is it really going to change that fast? And like, tell them what's going on. They're like, they actually get excited. Oh, yeah. Buyers are totally excited. They're like, I what? Know. I can compete? What? I can ask for things? You know what's funny is the only people that really freak out about interest rates and the change is you and I. Mm -hmm. Everybody well, else is like, it. or people refinancing. Everybody else is kind of like, well, I need a home. So what can I do? What, what am I able to do? So then we're going to go back 90 days and you'll always select coming soon. Coming soon does matter all the way to close. And then we're going to always select our dwelling type, single family homes in this case. Now I will tell you patio homes and town homes and condos can be confusing and Gemini twin homes when you're in the active adult communities. So sometimes I would need to select more than one. But when you're doing single family homes, please do not take into account any of the other properties. Um, then I'm gonna go down to my city. The reason I do this is because sometimes, have you noticed that in Arizona, some subdivisions are like duplicated between East and West for their master name, or they all have the word Estrella in them. Like that's really cool to like put it in everything. <laughs> they're like well look how long the mountain range is <laughs> I'm like just stop um so you can mess up kind of bad there so you always want to make sure you do this and then i'm going to go down to my subdivision these are my first areas now when i put in the subdivision i am not putting in garden lake estate why because i will pull nothing because data entry matters i put in garden lake and then shift eight key that will give me everything in garden lake why? Because data entry is everything and most people don't even put the proper subdivision. They just put Garden Lake. Yes, sir. Have you ever used books and maps for your subdivision? You can use books and maps. It, I do that if I can't find anything because I always stay per the appraisal guidelines within the subdivision first. And I know that should be the book and the map number, but sometimes it's a little broader than what I'm looking for because their book sometimes doesn't let me in. And the rule of thumb is subdivision, half mile radius without crossing major arteries. So that half mile radius to me would be the book and map. But when it comes to starting in the subdivision, I always start in the subdivision. But y'all got what um, Eric is saying, right? Because off the assessor number, when we were over on the assessor side, at the very top here, that is your book number, your map number, and then your parcel number. The way back, most people switch spelling gray off G R A Y and G R E Y. Oh, yeah, and then you put two in. Uh -huh. So there's a big guy next door, he's the one that says, Sir, just go by books and maps. Or you do Star Key Hawk. <laughs> See, there's two ways to do that. Uh, asterisk just search in more. It's a wild card also. Yeah, it's your wild card. Um, I always like it. I was playing Roma Cub last night, so just picture it as the winning piece. Or use books and maps. Like, what I, did you put in the books and maps? 
Um, you would you would have to add them. I don't think they're already. Are they already uploaded? Oh no, yeah, I knew that. I didn't know if it was already in there. You would have to put um APN in here. Or you do that. There's many ways to do these things. Yep, yep. Um, and so that's where I'm starting. And I see there's 38 properties. So remember, this was a single level home. So now I'm going to go back and it's going to say number of interior levels. And I'm going to say one for single level. And then my year built, this property was built in the 80s. So I'm going to say my max is 1990. And the reason is you don't ever go over the decade. And that gives me six properties. So now when I look at the six properties, I can go to map. And I can even dive in a little bit deeper because remember, we looked at the master plan community and there were some that you're like going, well, can you compare that to others? And we really wanted to try to stay in that inner circle. So look at this. So when I'm going and I'm going in, I have two on the outer circle and I have three on the inner circle. That's still not enough. So maybe I need to go back 120 days because the one thing I did not do, I did not. Oh, no, there's four. Good. I did not um, put in pool or no pool yet, right? So those basic, that basic information already took me down to a little bit. I always add little bits because if you go in with a whole enchilada, you will get zero. <laughs> Don't get zero. Um, so then I would, if usually you can always map around this too and say, okay, I only want this section. So I'm gonna just go ahead and do that for you guys. A lot of agents get really mad at these tools because um, their computer, makes them feel like they want to throw the computer because it won't stop moving. So you just click, click. And I'm only saying this because sometimes you're like, why is it not dragging? You have to click for it to drag. And when you're done, you double click and boom, you double click on the, that's, that's the key, my friend. You double click that last one. And now I'm going to go to those four results. And those four results, I'll go down here and I'll be like, okay, so I had one that sold with a pool on the lake recently for $5.99. It's 200 square feet smaller and one less bedroom. But I will tell you that the lake properties are about a $30,000 upgrade just on the lake. But that already takes me because the comparable is better. I'm going to subtract $30,000 right off the top from the comparable. So what I need you to write down is CBS. How do you find out? Um, you would. Give me a minute, Eric. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you bored? <laughs> I'm sorry. He's a really good pricer, by the way. Eric's a really good pricer. If you ever want a second opinion. Um, so CBS means that the comparable is better, you subtract value. SBA, SBA is your next key. And that is if the subject is better, you add value. Now, one thing I can do is spend, because this would literally take us a whole hour, to Eric's question, which is a very good question. Um, how do I know what a th third car bay is? How do I know what the lake is worth? Can I say that a property in Scottsdale on the lake would have the same amenity price point as the lake in Avondale? No. No. We are different. Yeah. <laughs> Avondale is lovely, by the way. Very nice. Um, but has the east side of town held more value over time? Yeah. So this is probably fifty to sixty thousand versus the thirty thousand. But I just know that because of my experience. But how do you figure that out? It's called a side by side comparison. You got to take apples for apples, and you have to go through historically. So I can go all the way back to two thousand eighteen if I want to, or even twenty twenty. And I'm going to pick all properties that close in a 90 day time frame with everything else being remotely the same, other than maybe this property sold on the lake and this property did not sell on the lake. And I'm going to find four properties, two that didn't sell on the lake within the same area, and then two that did. And I'm going to take the difference. And you're going to see usually about a $2,000 gap. Just to let you know, um, when you do that apples by apples comparison over time, and then you got to decide where do I, 2,000 gap meaning like it could be between $28,500 to $30,000. How far back? You can go back as far as you want. 
because you're taking apples for apples and you're doing the price point comparison. I was going back to 2018 because most people don't remember that anymore because we just went through the frenzy and I just wanted you to remember there was calmness in our life at one point. <laughs> and even though it's always been a seller's market, just so y'all know. So um, in my lifetime, in Arizona, America. <laughs> we keep having to drill down there. <laughs> um, so you would go back over time and you would take four properties again, two with two car garage in the exact same subdivision, and two with three car garage in the same exact subdivision. And you're going to subtract the difference with everything else being remotely the same. Okay. And that's going to give you about your range when it comes to that one amenity. You do not have a written book of. Um, amenities and values you have to go back and look at every area for what it is um i taught psa a few months ago and this lady was really mad at me because i didn't give her a written book of how much to add or subtract and i said well when did they give that to you she's like well last time i did real estate and i was like oh god she's gonna say 2005 and 2005 <laughs> um they would add value for granite countertops an appraiser would actually sit down with us and tell us we're going to add five grand for this, we're going to add this for this, we're going to add that for that. And what happened in 2005? We soared, right? So they were coming up with all these values. There is no written book of values. This is exactly what an appraiser does as well. They have to go back for that area and do apples for apples comparison and go, okay, what's this one amenity? Everything else being the thing, because it's not about the sales price, y'all. I'm not saying things haven't inflated. I'm saying Lake Hughes have been there since 1980. That, that property has a certain range. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So knowing that, I'm going to now look at this one, the one with the pool being the closest comparable. See, I would also need to go back and go, okay, how much is a bedroom worth? But do I make the adjustment for a bedroom or the square footage difference? Because I just saw there's a 200 square footage difference. But be really careful, guys, because when you start talking square feet, are you double dipping? And I will tell you sometimes square footage could equal $68,000 for 400 square feet. Can you really adjust up $68,000? An appraiser might take 10% of that if you haven't made adjustments for everything else. Because if I have, if I add value for a bedroom and I say a fourth bedroom for let's say $5,000 and I add $6,800 for a square footage difference, I just double dip. I added twice for the same concept. And so that's important to think about as well when you're pricing. So for this one, I'm going to briefly go through the house and see, is it nice or is it not nice? Because do, seven, two? Oh. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, and I don't want to keep you guys longer than I promised as well, but I'm going to say, okay, it looks like it's a clean kitchen. It has white cabinets has no handles, which is a Scottsdale thing. We all like handles on this side, on that side, down. we just keep touching our cabinet. It's very confusing. Um, it's a big, great room. It's clean. It's ready. I'm not going to say it's bad construction, but I do notice something when I'm looking through these photos as a realtor, not as a consumer. Consumers don't notice. They just fall in love. Um, these are original windows. And as I went through the house, those are original windows. In a older community that has sustained its value, do you think updating windows, roof, and other amenities will add value. Yes, yes. Yes. However, it means other people in my neighborhood will also need to have updated their windows over time to see that value come in. You can't just go to Maryville on 75th Avenue and Camelback and add windows to a block home and say, I'm going to add 10 grand for those windows because nobody else has improved in that block, right? So you have to be really careful to go, okay, is this a good decision? Is it going to add value or is it not? And it never adds what they spent. So um, in RPR, you can actually go into, you know, here's a zip code. If we add this, what will it add? But I will say be very careful with that tool because it will continually give you more money the more things you put in. And you'll be like, I'm going to win this listing. <laughs> but you have such an inflated price, you might as well have been selling last December. So those are the things you need to be careful of. In this case, because of how Garden Lake sits, I will tell you, we'll add energy efficiency could add anywhere between $2,500 and $5,000 in windows. Knowing that I spent $30,000 in windows, like did I have a joy factor there? 
Dory Thacker being like, I enjoy okay. <laughs> spending money or I mean, enjoying the windows oh, during my lifetime. Because some people will say to you, should I add, um, should I get granite countertops right before I go on the market? But they have perfectly fine formica art countertops that like when you wash them with um, vinegar, vinegar, that they look shiny like granite anyways. And it's like, does it, you think it's really going to add value? So for you spending $5,000, you might get like more people excited to buy your house, but does it add value to an appraiser? Debatable, right? So these are things we need to think about. So knowing that though, this is something that you sh should draw your eye to is always look at people's windows. Um, this is, these are dual pane, but 1990 style dual pane. Um, I know that too, because I replaced them. <laughs> but when you look, you can always see it when you go through the photos. And I was noticing as we're going through the house, all of the windows have a black edge to them. They have iron windows, like metal windows. And the 2000s in the 21st century, what kind of windows do we typically have in Arizona? Vinyl outsiding because it keeps it cooler. So that is going to be a factor that would play into my art of pricing because I can market based on it. I can't always justify an added value to an appraiser, but I can market. So knowing that if I'm just going off the one, there, I, I'm adjusting up, I'm adjusting down. I'm about at 575 after everything we talked about based on that one comparable. I would then do the same concept with two more comparables to get my range. So by the time I'm done with this one, being a horrible, it has a pool, but it is, it is significantly smaller. It's 500 square feet smaller. This one says 274, 60 a square foot. It's a three, two, um, and the lot is smaller. All I'm doing here is adding up. I might need to do more research to find something I don't have to make as many adjustments for, which would be a great reason to go four months back and then go six months back at your max, right? Just so I can make as few adjustments as possible. Can you make time adjustments? Yes. Yes. Date of sale adjustments also matter when we're looking six months back today because what sold in March is a whole different market than what's selling today. So I'll show you real fast how to do, do that too with the 1004 MC. But I will tell you, um, based on what I'm seeing here, I would price the house based on kind of what I'm seeing, 575 in my head right now for what's on the market. But then I want to kind of see what's, I mean, what's closed, what's on the market. Again, a 3-2, no pool is listed at 515. And then the one at 479 is a 3-2, 2000 and no pool again. So these aren't really competition to me because they don't even compare. So I'm in my own little competition bubble. So if I'm going to price it based on what's closed, I'm pricing at 575 today. Actually, I'm pricing at 569.9 because it does back up the garden with the parkway. Um, but these are all things you're going to research and look at. So knowing that, that's a big deal. Now, if I wanted to say, hey, what's going on with time of adjustments? I'm going to go back to my edit search. And I'm going to take out everything. And I'm going to go 365 days back. And we're going to pull that 1004 MC report. And I can do it just based on the 80s homes that are single levels. But I'm not looking for comps. I'm looking for what's happened in the market. Does that make sense? It's a 1004 MC report. So 1004 MC. And we do this every single month in your office meetings, right? Like we go over this report every month because it shows us the market trend. But you can condense it down to look at the market trend on the specific type of property. But again, we're not doing comparables. So I can see that 27 properties have closed that fit this basic criteria in the last year. So then I say view results. I go, and again, I'm not going to break this down. I'm going to go up to CMA. I'm going to say use so all results. Then you go over here and you select statistical CMA. You click next step. Take off total stats because it's confusing with the other. 
And then you actually click Fannie Mae 1004 MC. Oh, da, 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 da. and then you say view. When you view this, this is where your seller's mindset is. Look, 102% of list value, 0.3 month housing supply. Our median sales price was 417 and our median list price was 486. Now, keep in mind, it's gone up in median list and sales price, but then we have a three month housing supply. So knowing that, yeah, things are listing that's larger, that three months is going to affect how we price because here you blow out a candle and it happens. Here, we actually have to justify it. I can't really adjust time off the market for six months ago because I'm showing that we went up. So I'm telling you to stay flat, right? Don't adjust up, but don't adjust down for time off the market right now, just stay flat. If you were gonna present this to your seller, would you go through and take all the properties off that were on the lake? Um, you can do that, but I like to stay within that lake community and see what's going on first. Like you saw, I don't have enough to justify going and taking those out. If I had enough that were one street back or one house back from the lake, then I could take them off. But in this diagram, this example today, we didn't have enough to do that. But I'm just saying you just went back the whole year. Mm -hmm. Would it be beneficial to go back and just select the property on lake? No, I'm not going to do that okay. um, based on the fact that I'm trying to show a market trend of that area. Okay. But I like that. But three months housing supply. So this is more of a neutral market. So I just want you guys to kind of see where things are lining up when you're doing pricing. Okay, everyone good there? Yep. All right. The next thing I wanted to show you guys is your net sheets. Do you have five more minutes mm, yes. for net sheets? Okay, cool. I know Brie needs to go probably in season, but like... I just want to make sure you guys are good. So under menu, when you go under daily functions, there is a button called calculators. You're going to go closing cost, co closing cost estimator. Then you scroll down and you say run report. I know it's really odd. They changed the verbiage. Just click run report. It does nothing. <laughs> but take you to the screen. Then you're going to say new. When you say new, it will come up with some selections in a moment. Why? Thank you. And for the name of this one, I'm going to, can you see okay back there? Mm -hmm. Name it test. I always unclick display buyer summary. I will never do this for a buyer. The reason you never do it for a buyer is every lender has different costs, different overlays. Like that's a lender thing. That's a loan estimate. That is not a Mandy thing. It's not a realtor thing. And then the seller's name goes here. So in this case, it was Jacob and Mandy Neat. The property address, you can always just cut and paste. Now, my contract sales price has a little red button on it. Come on, go. You can tell when I use my mouse all day in the office because I can't make the pad work. Okay, <laughs> contract sales price. So I said we were going to list this at five sixty nine nine hundred, and I'm thinking days on market. We're about thirty days on market, so I'm going to say we're going to sell by the end of August, as an example. Or we're going to yeah, we're going to sell by the end of August, and we're going to close by the end of September. These are just examples. My property tax, I'm going to go back to the tax information and I'm going to go down and I'm going to see that the property tax was $23.69 for last year. And then the key is to hit tab. When you hit tab, it seems like the form um, calculates itself. The HOA fee is a, is a, a six month fee of $300. So it's $50 a month. And then my payoff. So this is why that payoff is so important. Do you have a solar that needs to be paid off? Do you have a first? Do you have a second? Do you have a HELOC? Um, and in this case, I think I owe like 285. Now, as a consumer, I'm gonna be really proud of my interest rate. My interest rate is 2.87%. Oh. It is, is that cool? Yeah. I'm keeping the test for everyone. Um, <laughs> so, 
the like consumer, I just want you to say, they're going to be like boasting their interest rate if they refi in the last two years. They're like, oh, so I want you to bump it up to 4%. Why? Because sometimes their interest rate um, that's sold to them, it's actually all the time, is a little different than the life interest, like 2.8. Seven five sounds amazing, but really it's like two point nine percent over after everything's calculated in. It's 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 weird how it all really works. But I bump it up because it's going to do my payoff for me. Your payoff is not based on how much you owe only. It also adds interest and other fees. So I always bump it up one whole percent. So that would take me to four percent. And I always tell them, I just like to pad this for you because at the end of the day, if they add fifty dollars to your payoff for making you a payoff statement. At the bank, I'd rather that just be calculated in. Does that make sense? Cool. And then I'm just, hopefully there's no prepayment penalty. Um, most loans do not have a prepayment penalty. However, if it's an owner finance, so also known as a carry back or hard money that they're paying off, there is a payoff penalty. Just so you know that, typically. So then I'm going to scroll all the way down to... Estimated settlement charges. This is where I put in my service fee. So I'm going to say my service fee on the listing is 3%. How many of you just got confused by that statement? This is not the total commission. This is where I'm going to talk about the listing side is 3%. The total amount Realty One Group charges is 6% of their sales price. However, when I break it down, I have a buyer consultation fee or a buyer representation fee and a listing representation fee. Now, in the event that no one, someone that comes to your property has no representation or elects to have dual agency with me as the only agent, I will reduce the total commission from 6% to 5% or 6% to 4%. Like however you guys want to finagle it. But the thing is, if I put 6% here, I'm going to tell you what that looks like. I'm not saying you're not worth 34,000. I'm saying it's a hard pill to swallow. So let's lighten the pills, like one step at a time. So we're just gonna put 3% here. And I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do in a moment. 17097. Then I'm gonna scroll down to where it shows my title charges. So here it says 2272. I always go up to the next 100 and add 100. So I'm gonna do 2400 and 800. Not rounding because rounding would be going down. I don't go down, I only go up. <laughs> and then where it says recording fees, I always double this to $100. I will tell you the recording fee is really $50. But for some reason, the other $50 always gets eaten up somewhere. And what do we do? We like to make our clients more money, right? Not less money. And I'm going to make one of these, by the way, on every single offer I ever receive. Because I don't want them to negotiate from the contract price. I want them to negotiate from the net. And then in here where it says additional settlement charges, there is not a place where it says HOA disclosure fees. A seller always pays their disclosure fees. What's the maximum amount an HOA can charge for disclosure 400. fees? 400 per HOA. So if that's a master and a secondary, 800. Okay, Greyhawk. <laughs> and then they were like, well, if I put an E instead of an A or an A instead of an E, maybe they won't catch that second one. No. So I, I use the HOA transfer fee box personally and I put 400 or you can click add settlement charge and you can say HOA disclosure fee and then put 400 here. Um, the home warranty is a topic that should be coming up. It's the largest risk management tool for a seller. Well, the buyer's gonna get fixed no matter what, buyer has to figure it out. But that disclosure issue comes up when they're overwhelmed because it's not being covered. Right. So here I'm going to put $600 as an average in my head right now. I'm going to then add a settlement charge called buyer representation fee. And that was 17097, I believe. That's the other 3%. However, please keep in mind 
there are no set commissions. We can talk about money in here because you're all within Realty One Group. You cannot speak about compensation on any cost to any agent outside of Realty One Group with Ron Copin because that is against the Anti-Sherman Trust Act of commission setting, price fixing. If you want to discuss further with consumers how pricing works, please write down competition.realtor. Your NAR board of directors have, or your NAR people have created an amazing website for people to understand that commissions are negotiable and this is how it works. So competition.realtor is like your new best friend. One settlement charge that we haven't written in a long time that you might want to pad people for up front in lieu of repairs or paying down the interest rate, right? So we could call this um, repair, repair costs. You could call it maintenance fees. You can call it um, in, in lieu of repairs. You can call it um, financial assistance. There's so many things you can call this. However, you need to know a little bit of your seller on the phone. You have to get a feel for them. Marsha deals with a lot of people from California. Californians do not like the idea of giving anybody closing costs. They want, and they never have in every market. They always want, um, and that's kind of me to categorize people, but Californians from the coast seem to want high earnest money. <laughs> they don't get it. Why it's not higher? <laughs> I'm like, because we're not higher. Um, and then they they would hate the idea of handing someone money to say, hey, here's some assistance. If you're going to buy my house, you need to be well qualified to buy my house. But you can talk to them about maintenance of their properties here, right? So we can take down your price point or we can just give a little bit of money. What's going to hurt you worse is probably taking down that price point because people won't feel the cash flow to actually get the maintenance items done when you take down the sales price because it barely affects your closing costs. But when you do in lieu of and they can keep their closing costs in their pocket, they can then take that money and go fix the items. Right? So that's a really big thing. The key is here up top, you have to click save. If you do not click save, I'm going to tell you right now, everything I type in words will be blank and you will be very mad at the screen or maybe that's just me. Get mad at the screen, throw the computer out the window. Once it's saved, then I go ahead. I don't know. Oh, an error occurred. Oh, I can tell you why. Because I probably have 5,000 things called test. <laughs> so I go up here and I rename it to test 55555. I definitely don't have that one. And I can then click, come on. All right, well, it doesn't like me, so I'm just going to PDF it and show you with, um, like I told you not to do, but all right, now, now it's saving. Okay, I do not have that name, but whatever makes you happy. Amazingly, it still did it. Um, my total estimated charges, first of all, keywords here, estimated cash to seller. This will not be read. It will say from seller or to seller. Please pay attention to this. In today's marketplace, really, there shouldn't be a reason for it to say from. Um, but there have been times where people are just trying to break even. And this says from, and they're like thinking they're going to make this. We have an issue. We have a specific performance issue at closing, right? It has your payoff from your mortgages. And then it says estimated settlement charges is 38494 What I need you to be prepared for. Please be prepared for the fact that they, most of this is your commission. So if you don't know your value when you go to this meeting, why would they pay this to you? Right? Because when I go down here and I break it down, I have my professional service fee of 17000 I have my title policy of 24, escrow 800, recording 100, my home warranty, right? Because it's going to market with a home warranty. Um, HOA disclosure of 400, and then the buyer representation fee of another 17,000, right? So the majority of this is the commission. This is why we see for sale by owners. For sale by owners do leave money on the table because they can't price their own home. And then think about what you do do for marketing and your biggest asset to a seller is risk management. Biggest asset. 
So knowing that that 38,494, uh, this client would make about 243,723. What's awesome is if I got exactly a full price offer with only what like what was talked about here, they would probably make closer to 245. And you know how good that feels when you hand someone more money than what you're like, this is a rough estimate. I have the fees a little bit. And they make a little bit more. They're like, woohoo, part time. What hurts is if they don't hit that because you can't do the math. So be really, really careful. I have read these calculators from time to time where I go back into edit a pre-done calculator and it just doesn't seem to be adding right. You always want to make sure the keys are to hit the tab button and double check your figures because every time you change anything up here, these do convert back to um, what's considered median price points for our marketplace. And we only kept them in as ARMLS because all of us cried when they took them away. They're like, fill it out yourself. <laughs> no, don't tell people to do that. That's awful. Awesome. <laughs> Give me that. Um, but this is where Susan and Bree really come into play for you guys. But I will tell you, if you don't have something, it will somehow be affected because we cannot guarantee who we're closing with. But it's great to talk to a seller up front about these are the advantages and look what I can help you with in your and these mandatory costs if you use this escrow company that I have more control over. Control meaning that we, we partner and we know each other. When you don't know who your escrow officer is and they're slacking, can your whole deal go sideways? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, a cash purchase uh, for one of my sellers about a year and a half ago, the um, escrow company, and I did everything right, Marcia, as an agent, I promise I did. Even when I yelled a little too much um, at the end to myself, right? because you can't yell at them, is I said, hey, did you um, get the payoff? Did you get everything you need for my seller? Follow, 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 follow up, follow up. Guess what they didn't pull? Common name. They didn't pull a common name. Guess what came back? Child support me. But 10 days after my client moved out of the property to clear it up, and he didn't realize he needed to talk about it because he had been making his payments and he was doing everything right with the courts. But because it was a lien, against him personally, that is one of the leads that have to be pay out, paid off with the payoff. And you need the child support place, CES, to give you the info. And even though they're there for good reason, they're just not always the nicest human that feel like they should react to things. Right? <laughs> so my client was out of his place for 10 days and had to sit there just because escrow did not pull a common name search. So I'm telling you, it's so, so important to have a big EO on your team and realize no matter how well you do your job, we can't force others to perform. And with that, guys, that's your net sheet today. A little bit about pricing again for you to just keep thinking and practicing. And um, any questions? I, sorry about that last thing. If someone owes child support, they have to, how would they have that paid off since you're paying that amount? Like, um, usually it becomes a lien if you are in arrears. Okay. So he was um, in arrears. And their child was 19 now, but he was still paying the arrears. Back to your valuation discussion, it really shocked me because it wasn't in my head that the underlayment on these tile roofs are essentially at the end of their useful life for a multiplicity of properties that we built back in the 90s. So on your valuation, how are you addressing that? We don't know who did the underlayment, who didn't. And you know that reared its head well, in, in um, a positive sense. We have a lot of things coming up with groups. Um, our our value is finally getting old, so to yeah, speak. Yeah. We were so it's new when like, I first started. Like they're they were really like, why isn't it working? <laughs> you know, it wasn't really like, 1970 home didn't feel old when I moved here. I was 30 years old. I'm from Michigan. I mean, we have homes from the 1800s. Like, what, what is that? Like, you know, it was no big deal. But how I think about it, it it's a talking point for price, it for repair and look discussions. Is, have you had any of these check down? Please note that these things could come up. You're not obligated to fix it, but if your true goal is to sell your home, we're going to have to come to some negotiation and that will affect your bottom line and we'll have those discussions when they come up. Also, we had... Um, a speaker at our last office meeting, and you can go back to the office meeting on Facebook. It was inspections over coffee, and they have a website, and they actually have videos about those items that you can share with your consumers. I liked him, and I liked him. That was awesome. Yeah, he was saying, he's like, I'm talking now. I'll be talking for a while. And I'm like, that's cool. I'm a little cynical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and thank God for the concessions aspect of the meeting, because I was right in yeah. the middle of the ocean, and there it was. 
Yeah, right? that's awesome. Prepared. Yeah. So this is the thing you take to look to the bridges? Yes. Um, have I ever forgotten my net sheet when <laughs> <laughs> yes? And I sit there in the car on my little estimator calculators that are on apps and on rocktitle.com. And I'll make one and say, oh, by the way, could you open your email? I'd, be, I'd love to show you what I emailed you on my way here. Yeah. Because that's called saving my own butt. Um, okay. And thank you, Rock Title, for having those estimator calculators. But I'd rather use this one and do it myself. Also, now I can go, I can go to Zillow at this point and see what Zillow says. I have no idea what Zillow says. Because when I go to walk into a listing, does the seller already know what they want to price their home at? Yeah. yeah. And do they know why they want to face their home there? <laughs> yeah, and, and I have no issue. I actually really enjoy the fact that people can find out information for themselves. Because why should you take my word for it? You just met me. Yeah, you refer to me or we met somehow, but why, why should you take my word? Go research for yourself. I empower you. I, I, I think it's great, but let me tell you why it's so important to use a realtor. Let me point out Article 11. Let me show you everything I do when it comes to evaluating your property. Let me showcase my value, right, Linda? Like all day long. So let's see, let's see a little bit. I have no idea, I have not looked. Maybe my husband has, I don't know. It's rare. Oh, I'm higher. <laughs> They're lower. Wow. Why? Because they don't feel my community, right? So when I go down here, and I go, oh, wow, Zillow's not even hitting it. <laughs> They're way off by the, they are way off on my net proceeds. <laughs> no way, right? And then I go sit here and I'm going to go line by line and say, are you comparable? Are you comparable? Are you comparable? Oh, look, they went all the way outside that range. I told you you shouldn't go out. Oh, look, just to let you know, the 80s homes in Garden Lake are not comparable to the 90s homes. Why? Because the 90s homes weren't built as nice as the UBC products. Um, that builder sold out halfway through. These are things you get to know. When you saw in a community, when you when you really farm an area, you need to know it, right? And you get to know those things. So I could sit here with my, my client and I could go bing, 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 bing. And we could go through what they're being compared to. And I'm going to tell you, they're just taking properties in the area and crunching them. And is that fair? Sundance, Arizona, um, Sundance is in Buckeye, Arizona. Sundance is a master plan community right off Miller, uh, the uh, Watson, Watson exit when you go towards California. I just figured you've all taken I-10 to California. And it's huge. It has golf course lots, it has active adult lots, it has um, basic move-in ready, like um, starter home price point homes. It will take everything and compile and say, boom, there's your value. Do you think an active adult gated area of Sundance is comparable, comparable to the other side of Sundance, which is just basic three bedroom, two bathroom starter homes? No, but yet it tells you that your house is worth golf price, right? So it's really cool to be able to go through here and see it. And it's cool that now in today's market, I can beat it for this situation. But you always want to know these things before you go in so you're prepared for the discussion. But before you ever go here, you always come up with your own calculations. And I'm, I feel really good. And no, I, I don't try to fluff my numbers even when I own the house. Because <laughs> I've been in too many appraisal headaches. <laughs> so um, any other questions? Everybody good? Well, it's been really fun. I'm going to head down to state now, but it's been great spending the morning with you. And I'll be back this afternoon. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Manual school. Yes. Someone does a for sale by owner.